Hello everyone and welcome to The Download. As many of you know, we have just this past Friday officially launched our resistance movement. Now a few thoughts on the resistance are in order. Its intent is to combat, to resist the woeful loss of Catholic identity among church leaders, clergy, and laity. It's important to note that a loss of identity first begins in the interior and only then is made manifest in the exterior. This is why so many efforts to recapture, for example, a faithful Catholic liturgical life fall flat. Too many clerics simply no longer sense their own Catholic identity. Same with the ever-shrinking number of people in the pews. They offer no protest against the abuse-ridden liturgies in their parishes because they have no sense of Catholic identity. The resistance is meant to zero in on this single issue, the loss of Catholic identity, and that has happened over a wide expanse of areas. Brad, what are, I mean, it's not just mass, it's everywhere. No, I think it's, it's extremely important to draw people's view to this idea of identity. What you do is intrinsically bound up in what you are. And in this case, the church is not a what, it's a who, Jesus Christ, priest, prophet, and king. He came to sacrifice himself to save us from sin. And his church, which is members of his, his mystical body, are, he is working through them in the Holy Spirit to do just that. If you lose sight of what the church or who the church is, then everything you do uh, will be skewed. Right. So in, in the churches around the, the parishes around the country, you have the altars are now communion rails. Why? Because we're here to uh, encourage community and socialism saving the churches there as a glorified social worker to save people from suffering by saving them from poverty. Uh, Christ came to save us from uh, oppression and uh, not from sin. So we're there to bolster everyone's emotions, not offend anybody because that would be seen as oppression. So their liturgy actually is reflecting that today. Mm -hmm. We no longer have the sacrifice, the priest offering the sacrifice for sin to save the people from their sins, and it's necessary. We need to actually market the church again as the only means. Christ said, I am the only way to the Father. Therefore, his mystical body is the mediatrix of all graces. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, we've lost that sense in the liturgy. We've lost that sense in the parish life because now clericalism, which everybody wants to be a priest, and feminism, uh, this feminism, which we recently saw last week stem from the sisters wanting to become deacons, part of the sacerdotal office, which is an impossibility, uh, is, is still roaring through the, uh, through the parish life. And we also have this going on in politics. We want to separate morality. I'm a good Catholic, but I can separate my morality in a schizophrenic way from my political decisions. Yeah, it's just, and the, the, the understanding of I'm a Catholic, and then therefore this is who I am, and these are the things I do, has just been washed away. Yeah. Well, how do we get here? Yeah, well, in the early colonies, there's no doubt that there was a very clear, stark differentiation between Protestants and Catholics. Catholics were a persecuted minority. This was the time, you know, in the 17th century, um, you had the British penal laws going on in England where Catholics were being persecuted, tortured, executed. Well, some of those penal laws were actually enforced in the American colonies. For instance, in Boston, a Puritan stronghold. It was punishable by death to convert a Protestant to Catholicism. It was punishable by death to shelter a Catholic priest. You were fined if you didn't go to a, a Protestant service every week. And so Catholics had... was going on in England at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Right? So Catholics were very, um, you know, I mean, they were Catholic. But then, and then that continued on generally through the 19th century. You had a lot, the big influx of Catholic immigrants coming from Germany, Ireland, Poland. They were starting up their own parochial schools. And so there was a strong surge in nativist sentiment, anti-immigrant sentiment, which was really anti-Catholic right. sentiment, mm -hmm. which sort of reached its zenith in the Philadelphia riots in 1844, which was the bloodiest kind of anti-Catholic riot that took place. Lots of Catholics died. Catholic homes, churches, schools were just burned to the ground. So, um, and then you have this Catholic, anti-Catholic um, um, animus in education. You have Blaine amendments, you know, trying to force Catholics to go to public schools instead of, instead of Catholic schools. So we had to fight for that right to have Catholic education. But then you start moving over to World War II, 
And Catholics are now, they're fighting alongside their Protestant mm -hmm. brothers. They're now seeing, there's more camaraderie. They're seen as comrades in arms. So this barrier starts to slowly break down. Vatican II comes along, adornamento, opening your arms to the world, welcoming the world in and not cutting it off. Um, JFK becomes our first Catholic president. People are kind of leery about that, but they're thinking, well, you know, so. Give the Catholic a chance. Exactly. And, and then he also <laughs> says, you know, the whole, my faith is private. I won't impose it in the public sphere. And so th there's just this whole kind of wholesale loss of identity of who we are as Catholics just in every sphere. And that's how we get to where we are today. Yeah. Simon, you've got the answer, right? What's the answer for all this? Well, th this, it's, it's a bit complicated <laughs> answer, but it can be summed up by, by one word, which is laity. Right. So the laity have got to be the people to fix this. Uh, now, Fulton Sheen uh, himself said that. He said, don't look to the bishops, the hierarchy, to fix the church. Look to the laity. Look to yourselves. And kind of here's why. Um, you, you've all talked about the interior identity being uh, of, of the greatest importance. The interior identity is the soil out of which the exterior identity grows. It's the foundation on which the edifice, the visible edifice of the church is built. Now, the laity are the people who need to be exercising that interior life. The bishops, the hierarchy, there are, it's, it's an external thing. You see the bishop you see, in his mitre. You see the priest in his collar and his cassock, hopefully a cassock, uh, not a, a, a sports coat walking around. Right. But you, um, you, you see them, but the interior life of devotions, of regularly going to mass, of adoration, of saying the rosary, of regular recourse to the sacraments, of all of the things that are kind of the foundation for the resistance to be a good, holy Catholic, they're essential for the laity. The hope is that you can actually rattle the cages of these bishops because so many of them, as Brad has said, it's not all about sex, Christine. A lot of the time, as you've said, Brad, it's actually about the money. Yeah. And the bishops are going where the money is. And they see, well, the vast majority of people are kind of eh, wishy-washy modernists. Mm -hmm. Maybe we need to pander to that so that I can keep the money coming in, not from necessarily a mercenary exercise. No, but just, you've, got but just, run, you, you've got to run the temporal affairs yeah, of the church. I've got, I, I've got a machine and it needs fuel and that fuel is money so I need to do that. Well, we but it's the same thing here. Yeah. I mean you, you can't you can't just dismiss and say anybody who's worrying about money is some greedy they're not focused no. on God. I mean you know you look you know the apostles had to eat and yeah. then, you know our Lord didn't walk around with the apostles for three years and not eat. Not I mean, eat. You've got yeah. to take care of those things but when those things become flipped, flipped. I mean, that becomes that, the that becomes the difficulty. And it's 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 a very important thing that we, we have to show and that there's a priest recommended once to Latin mass communities to people who are going to the Trinity mass be very active in your parish um, you've got to be more than just turning up for the Latin mass you've got to be active yep. so the priest sees you and goes ah those people are good parishioners meaning they're active in the parish and they're doing stuff so yeah that's what the laity have got to do be active be holy there but I will a, say this though. Well, I think it is all about ladies first. Ladies. I think it is all about sex because <laughs> how do they keep their money by telling their priests not to talk about you know the hard thing, not sexual morality. Right. Certainly, so. certainly, out in the I think there yeah. there is this relationship we've got to understand that back in the '60s, when really, I mean, the, the Catholic identity loss on a theological level had begun before Vatican II. Yeah. You know, that was the case. You just look at numbers. I mean, the numbers were already on the decline. They just weren't as stark as they were after the Second Vatican Council. But there was this sort of, uh, you know, give and take, a quid pro quo. I really think we got to say that most Catholics were content to maintain at least the outward trappings of the faith as long as when they went to Mass, they were not hearing that you can't use contraception, divorce is horrible, all these things, and that's just accelerated. So now you have to cross off contraception as a topic. In the last 20 or 30 years, you also have to cross off divorce, abortion, you know, homosexual, whatever, and just keep going down the list. So the only thing you're left to talk about is what you're saying. You just sit there and talk about, well, you know, let's all be nice to each other and give $10 to the Catholic Relief Services. Well, see, what you just said, right, give $10 to Catholic Relief Services, and what Simon says, a lot of it's about the money, there's a problem because we have, what, what I originally said, we've become, and we've talked about this on the download before, this socialism, which the church has condemned, has become our mission to save people from poverty by saving, by saving them from suffering, by saving them with money. Mm -hmm. So we throw money at the problem. We need to throw truth and grace at the problem. We need to educate and get oh, the people it, to stop living a life that spirals yeah. into this situation. Well, because the pro there's a loss of supernatural, you know, belief in the supernatural. Yeah. So everything is natural. We have to fix it in a natural way. And if I, they're poor, give them money. If they're hungry, give them food. And I think that was shown at the last synod. Yeah. Uh, even Archbishop Chaput said, we default to believing that people won't accept the truth. 
That's the problem. We have and that's lost. true. Some people won't accept we the truth. Have, that doesn't mean you're, you're yeah, alleviated from the command well, yeah, from Jesus but, Christ to preach it. But, 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 that, but the most important done. thing with regard to that is, you know, there's, okay, so you've got a whole bunch of people out there. There's a segment of people who are never going to accept the truth. Let me tell you how none of them are ever going to accept the truth. Right. If you never, never present it, the truth. <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing, right. you know, and that, that's, that's the difficulty. So let's talk yes. about resistance specifically what we're yes. doing. Okay, so to bring everybody up to speed, we've, you know, uh, since like what, end of December, January, sometime frame, we, we said need to form a resistance, blah, blah. So here's where we are with everything now. We have really kind of two or three levels of ways or areas in which people can become involved. They can become an organizer. Um, we've had uh, hundreds of people respond to that. And for those of you who have signed up to be an organizer, we're sifting through everything. You should be getting an email from us by the end of the week. What we want to try to do is do this on a diocesan level. Some dioceses have one person that have signed up to just be the organizer there. Other dioceses or archdioceses have had multiple people. So we're, we're first going to get our ducks in a row here and then be in touch with you via email. Another way to be a supporter and uh, join in the resistance is you know, lots of people don't have time to be an organizer because it's, it's an investment. Absolutely, it's a time investment. Uh, but the things that we're going to be doing, rolling out podcasts for seminarians, rolling out in, in, you know, new, relatively newly ordained baby priests, uh, all of this stuff costs money and takes time to do everything, you know, bring people in, contractors, all of that. So uh, if you can help out with the $25 a month, we have hundreds of people who have promised to do all of that and are doing that. So thank you very much for that as well. And then the third way is if you don't have the money or the time, but you will be called upon if you want to help in some way, part of the deal here is to develop a network across the country and across the world where Catholics who understand these issues can get together on some regular basis and not sit together and have some, you know, you know, kibitch section about, uh, session about all of this. And, oh, my priest does, my parish that, blah, blah. We already do all that. Everybody does all that. The idea here is to sit and learn the faith because the loss of Catholic identity, I think we would all agree, has come about because there has been a wiping out of Catholic knowledge. Right. Catholic intellect, that's why the Alpha program. They want to engage the emotions instead of the intellect. Talk about how fun it is, let's hold hands and have light shows and big movie screens and TVs and all that. I mean, one, one archdiocese, which shall remain nameless, uh, uh, actually put out a thing and said, this is the best light show in a church you will ever see. <laughs> that's a, that, that's a what very the, low bar. Wow. What the hell yeah. does that have to do with salvation? Right. That's ridiculous. That's, well, so they, this sort of thing, emotions, people will accept the truth. They but don't, won't, they don't, there's no faith. People they, in they, the resistance movement need to understand. It's not enough. You know, people say, oh, I went to go kneel down to receive communion. The priest yelled at me, and then he pulled me aside after Mass and said, the bishop said not to do that. And you're like, well, I don't know what to say. Well, that point of the resistance in that one area is to give you the knowledge to know what to say back. Yeah, yeah. I think to, I think there's a there's on that subject, and this is something I think that people need to be aware of. Obviously, the normally because this is going to be a free show so there's going to be a bunch of people watching this who might not normally watch the download but the premium channel that we have the premium content has got much more than just the download on it it's oh, got yeah. a bunch of shows oh that answer those kind of questions i mean specifically on the issue of communion in the hand we have like a show about that we're doing another one mm -hmm. there's a bunch of stuff on all of these things they're there so if you want to be educated you've got your little resistance cell yeah. get together watch a couple of our shows talk about it discuss it you know and, and do that that's a great way to yeah. participate. The flagship show of this apostolate is One True Faith. I mean, that's what started this whole apostolate. I mean, the, the name, the title itself, One True Faith. There's a sense the in which, one the One True, true Faith. <laughs> look, there's a sense in which evangelism today, there's almost an embarrassment to proclaim oh, the superiority oh, of the oh, Catholic I've, faith. I've, and I've we are, the that's, that's the thing that impressed me yeah. about this apostolate was, you know, that's your flagship show. It, it this is, Catholicism, pure, unadulterated Catholicism, and we can't be embarrassed to proclaim that. Catholics out there can't be embarrassed to proclaim that. And, you know, this, we hear that too, as well, I just don't know what to say. That's not an excuse. Yeah. That's not an excuse. That means you need to go and learn so that you know what to say. Yeah, I'll use the example again of a uh, of lady, fine Catholic lady, you know, mom of, you know, great Catholic kids. Uh, I was talking with her and she said, uh, she made the comment, uh, well, you know, my, my brothers and sisters, and she was you know, in the 40s, I guess, my brothers and sisters have all, you know, left the faith and they've all joined this inter non-denominational blah, 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 and they asked something about scripture and I don't know what to say. And I looked right at her and I said, well, whose fault is that? Yeah. You know, what, did somebody say you can't open up the Bible, you can't have a yeah. Catholic Bible study, make sure it's a Catholic Bible study? Yeah. Scripture understanding? Yeah. I mean, yeah. this is not, yeah, does it, 
the thing that I think people, many good Catholics, maybe who aren't, sort, they're sort of just sort of superficially on the level of they understand there's a crisis, but you know they've got a million other things to do kind of thing, is that they don't understand how deep this crisis is. Currently, even still, in the seminaries, in the, in the chancery offices, I mean, the very fact that a major archdiocese, uh, such as Detroit, but not just Detroit, would be, uh, you know, holding up the Alpha program, a catechism, not even that, but in an evangelization tool which kind of skirts around catechetical issues, holding that up as sort of the model to re-evangelize the church, <laughs> something diluted. developed by a man who denies the <laughs> supremacy of the Catholic yeah. faith, Again, I'm going to say it because I want to keep bringing the point up. What the hell is wrong with you doing that? You can't, you can't talk about anything in the Catholic faith unless you begin with the point that this is the church established by well, Christ. I think it was very telling that you spoke to some monsignor in Washington. You said if yeah, yeah. you could press a button, everybody could become Catholic. Would you do that? And he, he hesitated. He hesitated. You know, I mean, because people have lost this belief that we really are the one true faith. Yeah and were necessary for salvation. Well, when we, were, when we were shopping Launch for Faith around for TV series years and years ago, it went, I forget where, and I won't try to remember for the sake of their embarrassment, but it went to some diocese who had a TV uh, station, they had a little network, and the guy in charge of evangelization for the diocese was on the phone with us, and he said, well, you know, I find the name the one true faith, a little sort of offensive, because, you know, well, I've got Protestant friends. Yeah. And quick as a flash, we said, do you try to convert them? Yep. And they went, well, I, I, well, I wouldn't want to, you know, <laughs> extra ecclesium nulla yeah. salus. But, it's the same. Yeah. Look it up. part of Catholic identity is simply that you are a member, you are a cell of the mystical body of Jesus Christ, and there is no other means to salvation. Yeah. Now, we're not getting into all the theology thing about what happens to a four-year-old Muslim boy who dies. We're talking about the normative world, yes. the world that 95% of the world lives in. Catholic Church is the means for salvation. Outside of it, there well, is no salvation. Nobody believes that anymore. Even a little boy who's yeah. saved is still saved by the merits of Christ, and that is through Christ is church. the church. Right. Comes yes. through the so church. So all yeah. graces come through Christ and comes through the church. This word triumphalistic was Catholic shaming back in the day, yeah. in the yeah. 70s. So if you're actually saying, well, we have the fullness of truth and the fullness of grace, just because Christ is the one yeah. that has the fullness yeah. of truth and grace, then you're triumphalistic. You're arrogant, you're superior. And the, the toleration has come from two different points. Mm -hmm. One is we don't want to offend. My gosh, if you offend somebody and they cry to tears, it's terrible. Uh, this <laughs> idea of also we enthrone conscience because everybody's their own pope right now. Right. Uh, that came from the Protestant Revolution and we've just it's enthroned Right that. out of the mouth of Martin Luther. In the 60s, we, we went with sociology and psychology because that's the sciences, you know. They are objective and we can't, we have to, so everybody wanted to use that. Uh, and that led to, there's no certitude speaking in the morals with sociology and psychology. So this led to this relativism, which also is this idea from Martin Luther and it got enshrined with the French Revolution. So now that you have those, let's see how Jesus actually handled all that. The woman at the well, he first of all called out her faith. He said, you adore that which you know not. Wow, isn't that offensive? We adore that which we know, for salvation <laughs> is of the Jews. That's triumphalistic. Sure it is. We should be saying this. Mm -hmm. We worship what we know. We're the Catholic Church. Salvation comes from the Catholic Church. Then he called out her morals. That was her dogma that was uh, uh, wanting. And he says, you've had five husbands, and the husband you have now is not your husband. It's like, whoa, where are you going with that? And then he comes out and says, as far as the Messiah, I am he. Well, right there you have the total plan of, of evangelization, sure. catechism, conversion. And, and how she, did she went, respond? she was converted. Yeah. yeah, and she converted. And after she was converted, she went and told the whole town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You gotta come listen to this guy. Look what happened. Sense. What he told me, he told me all my sins. What happened if he just said, well, I don't want to offend you, so I'm not gonna talk about any of these things. See, one of the interesting well, things was, was offensive. She tried to change the subject. subject. Oh, several times. In the middle several, of it, yeah. she's like, um, okay, your husband. <laughs> that was so, his evangelical that, Those are nice samples you have. But I think, I think it's very interesting to talk about triumphalism. And it's, my response to that has always been, because I kind of found that, and I converted you know, almost overnight from atheism to Catholicism and you know, became a you know, very strong evangelist for Catholicism. People say, whoa, 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 well, you know, this is very, you know, you're going around telling everyone is wrong. And it's like, yeah, you, by your very nature of believing something other than what I do, tell me I'm wrong. That's the way adults have a conversation. 
You know, that's, that's the way the world works. You don't get to say, well, I'm a Baptist and therefore I go to a Baptist church. Okay, so do you believe that's 100% right? If you don't, you shouldn't yeah, be if you going don't, you're there. a bad Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> you know a background in math. You, no one goes to a calculus class yeah. and says, well, I believe it's this and I believe it's that. that. The calculus teacher said, you came here to learn, to learn. math, yeah. sit down and learn it. Yeah. Well, the same thing with the Catholic Church. Yeah. You want to come and learn about Christianity? Take a seat. We'll teach you. Yeah, yeah the whole... The, the, the whole movement that we want to really build. And I think we're off to a pretty good start. I mean, hundreds and hundreds oh, yeah. and hundreds of people mm -hmm. yeah. signed up. To be organized. I mean, not just to be organized and participants, yeah. people and they're still signing them. I mean, yeah. You know, I see stuff on my phone here. It's like ding ding ding. They're like, oh well goodness, this is this is fantastic. So thank you for all of that. Uh, but you know the point here the point I just want to make sure the point isn't you know to like let's go storm the chancery with pitchforks and things like that. It is to understand that the collapse of the faith has gotten so down into the roots of the faith that you know the, this constant like going on about all oh, the Pope should do this and the Pope should look. If the Pope came out tomorrow and said we're going to go back to all this and everything, he'd have resistance on his own hands from hundreds of bishops, if not thousands. Benedict actually said that himself. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, my authority Benedict, stops at the door. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he said my authority stops at the door. He made the point that you know we've got bishops who are just you know poorly formed. We're going to have to weather through them. Yeah. I mean, look, this silly notion that, oh, the Pope runs the church like a CEO and can just fire this bishop and fire that bishop and everything's okay. The problem is so much deeper. You know, the local bishops and even within chancery offices where the bishop is good, the people around him work against the bishop if he's an Orthodox bishop. It's the orthodoxy, it's that Catholic identity that is being, you know, hammered away at, almost obliterated on a local level. You think if, you know, if, if the Pope comes out tomorrow and says, fix all of this, do you really think the crazy ex-nun that runs an RCIA program or is a religious ed director of the diocese is all of a sudden going to start preaching the truth? No. Well, but it goes That's what needs that. to be resisted. But it goes deeper than that as well because it's not just a question of saying resist these you know, crazy bishops and crazy liberal nuns. The laity themselves yeah. need to be reformed. Sure, the, they do. The, the, the that's yes, the point of this. Yeah. And that's to the get whole thing. people together, get them in yeah. the room. You learn the faith so that when your sister says, I'm getting married outside the church, you know what to say. You can't say, Pope Francis, tell her she's doing something wrong. You tell her she's, she's doing, doing something, something wrong. wrong. Actually, because Bishop <laughs> Christina said yeah. that. We don't need more people to uh, stand up and say this is the truth as far as clerics and bishops specifically. Mm -hmm. He said we more, need more lay people to stand up and say that is wrong. Yeah, that's, that's a direct wrong. quote from Bishop yeah. Crescita. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's the point of the resistance, to go at a grassroots level. The laity don't have authority in the church. Our Lord didn't set it up that way. I mean, we can certainly appeal and say, hey, you know, can you do this or do that? But, but that's where it draws on. We're not guys that make the decisions. We're not the guys that make the prudential judgments, bad or good. But we are the people who are, as Vatican II said, there's a call to holiness on our part to go out and convert the world. And right now, following, as, as John Paul said, the world that needs first correcting is the world of the church. Catholics who need re-evangelizing, new evangelization. And that's the point of all this. And it's the point, right, that's we brought it out here in the book in uh, it's chapter, chapter 17, 17 is where all of this discussion began here. But this is kind of a bit of a manifesto of sort of a tracing of here's the problem, here's the effects of it. I mean, there's a philosophy present in the church right now that is just sucked out of the secular world. And it is that there is no exceptionalism, there is everybody's the same, there's no objective truth, there is objective truth, there is something that is right and there is something that is wrong. And this kind of walking both lines and, you know, walking straddling the middle of this like many clerics do, it's destroyed the faith oh, it of hundreds of millions of people over the last 50 years. Hundreds of millions. What's the thing? The uh, second largest group in the United States is ex-Catholics. Ex -Catholics? Yeah. yeah. That's just, I mean, that, if Shocking. that doesn't blow you yeah. away, and that group keeps growing, yeah. that group well, that keeps growing every day. They stop teaching the faith. That's it. They stop missionizing. And Benedict called that out last year in that uh, interview. And he said, you know, yeah. this is the problem. We believed everybody's saved, or we don't believe we all have the truth. And therefore, we stop missionizing. We stop catechizing from the pulpit. We stop sending missionaries out to the world. We stop believing there's a necessity to convert from your sinful life to the conscience of Christ. Uh, and it's disheartening that this diocese and others are going to just rehash this emotional fervor with yeah. lacking the theological content. They're not going to engage in the intellect. It's not going to be a conversion of conviction. It's just going to be a temporary emotional fling with the church. And then once the RCIA happens, they leave the church again. But yeah, the point of, I think the point of the resistance is don't sit around waiting for your bishops to do something. No. Do yeah. it yourself. Right. Yeah. Just do it. 
And you should. Look, if the bishop is instituting or the parish priest or whoever is instituting some stupid thing, well, sure, you should go up and absolutely say mm -hmm. something. But you need to understand not just, boy, that doesn't seem right. You need to understand why, why it's wrong and be able to have an intelligent conversation. Are you going to convince a priest who doesn't really see Catholic identity as any big deal? No. Probably not. But you know what? The 10 or 15 people that come over to your house every you'll two weeks, them. you'll talking to them, and they can go out and talk to their lay people. That's it. They're, you know, their other lay friends and you know, sisters and brothers and kids and whatever. And you, but you, you know, this problem has been going on for decades. It is not going to be solved in a year. And that's what I think we really need to understand here. I mean, long after we're all said and gone, I, it's said and done, I hope the, this whole resistance thing gets its legs and keeps doing it. It has to be a renewed sense. And there are good things in the church already kind of doing this. The Blue Army effort, for example, is a great effort. Uh, but, you know, there needs to be an understanding of the crisis so that you can speak in terms of the crisis. What we have ultimately here is a semi-Arianism that has invaded the church, that Jesus... God bless him, <laughs> isn't really who he said he was. He's a great Superman, he's kind of God-ish, but he's my friend and my pal more than he's my king and my savior. And that's the big overarching thing that the resistance needs to attack and begin to eat away at termites like the faith was eaten away at by termites. We're using their tactics on them. Well, if you don't know who Christ is, then you don't know what the church is, and you don't know what the church is supposed to do, and you don't know what your role in the world is. Yeah, that's it, that's it. The overriding impact of the loss of Catholic identity has been a flattening of theology. There is no such thing any longer in the minds of almost every Catholic, the idea of Catholic exceptionalism. But that is precisely why we are Catholics. Not because we are exceptional, but because the church is exceptional. It is the exception in the world of religion because of who established it and why he established it. No other religion, not one on earth, has the attributes of the one holy Catholic apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation. The goal of the resistance movement is to resist anything or anyone in the church that seeks to drag down this exceptionalism, this truth, most especially on the local level where the damage is really done. If you haven't signed up yet to help by either being a monthly donor or a local organizer or a helper on the local level or all three, please do so now. We've attached a link and thank you in advance. So for the entire resisting panel here, I'm Michael Vorsling. Thank you for tuning in today and we'll see you tomorrow right here on the download. God love you.